Good morning. Wasn't that duet just incredible? Amen. Wow. Oh, it's so good to uh, to be with you this morning. And I, uh, I could probably wish that, well, I don't really because this is God's direction. I'm going to say I could wish that I was in a different passage and something a little bit more uplifting. But all Scripture is inspired by God. And so we are here uh, to study His Word and everything has its place and its reason. And uh, this is a study in that sense, going through Corinthians, this rambunctious church that is edifying for us because we need to know and understand what is being said here in these passages. Now, I do remind you, well, let me just say, first of all, if you do have a song in your heart, the uh, Super Bowl is occurring tonight, right here, okay? Because we're having a baptism. And I would encourage you to come out. That's, that's where it's really happening, okay? It's, it's, it's going to be right here is where it's really happening. Uh, and by the way, I'm aware that the Super Bowl is not this weekend, so, but uh, there is one happening or occurring right here. Now, back on track, I lost my train of thought, but uh, uh, we're, we're dealing with a, an early, one of the earliest churches who are off base. And they're off base in self-centeredness. And you and I know that our natural bent is towards self-centeredness. We are born self-centered. That's why even those cute little wonderful babies, even my grandchildren, that go wah-wah, they want their way and not your way. And as we get older, we learn how to clothe that better in political correctness or whatever, but we still want our way more than somebody else's way. But let me say that we have gone through a study clearly of love. And we understand what love is by looking at the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. He didn't come here for His convenience and comfort. He came here to save sinners. And it took the horrendous death of the Son of God. And we are to live for Him and for one another. And so when we're looking at these things that pertain to temporary gifts that started in chapter 12 that God has given to nurture the early church and to bring about maturity, it's understandable that in self-centeredness and in confusion that individuals could be misguided to abuse those things that God has given. That's been true with everything that God gives down through the centuries, isn't it? And by the way, it's also true today. So we're jumping in now back in our passage in chapter 14 beginning now in verse 13 and all of the context has to be understood in order to get where we are, but if I try to spend my time going back over that, we're going to be here till 2 o'clock and you won't be happy at all about that. So I'm basically going to have to just sort of jump in anyway. And there is a little change of focus that is seen here and we'll discuss that. But let me just remind you that gifts are to edify. In fact, that's exactly what Paul reiterated again at the end of verse 12 before we get to verse 13. And that's why he says the therefore, and that's what the therefore is there for, to connect back to <laughs> the gifts were to edify. We've already been told that temporary gifts will cease. We've already been told that the testimony and of, uh, of everything about really serving, and that's what the purpose of gifts are, is for the purpose of love edifying one another, building up one another in Jesus Christ. And we saw that very clearly, and that's why Paul inserted what we think of as the love chapter, which is chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. That is the goal. In fact, the goal of our instruction, as James says, is love. 
and the paraded gifts of tongues, which was the most visible of the early temporary gifts, speaking in a foreign language because it brought attention on the one that was speaking, right? Or it could. Its purpose was not to bring attention to self. Its purpose was to edify, but it could bring attention on self. And so it's being paraded and abused in the church and adding to the confusion and the trouble. And Paul, as the apostle, is correcting that. And so we continue in his line of, with his wonderful mind, and of course this is all under inspiration of reading this particular you're going through this particular portion of Scripture. With that in mind, bow with me, please, and let's ask particularly the Lord to have mercy on us as we study His Word. <coughs> Father, we need to know Thee. We need to know Thy ways and understand Thy will and Thy purposes. Help us to do that now. As we look into your word, we recognize that what we do is not something we do because we're smart or we're, we're more capable than someone else, but it's only by your spirit to guide and direct and give understanding, to open our eyes, Father, that we might behold thee. Teach us from your word. Bless us, Father, that we might be a blessing. Edify us that we might sharpen and edify one another. And most importantly, that Jesus Christ would be honored and glorified in our midst. We beseech you for these things in his most precious and holy name. Amen. I think I've said it before. I'm sure I have. And whether I said it or not, it's, <laughs> it's a reality that the Word of God and Christianity always makes sense. Christianity is not something to be ashamed of. If you're if you, unchristianity or any other of the things that are out there, humanism and atheism and, and all the other isms and all the other beliefs and all the other practices, they're the ones that don't make sense. Christianity is the only thing that makes sense. And that being understood and realized and believed, if something appears unreasonable, reasonable, if I can talk, juvenile, out of character with God, it's not Christianity. It's our definition of it or it's our abuse of it or it's our confusion but it's not Christianity itself because this word, <laughs> it's, it's like a wonderful highway. It's called light. And the reason it is identified as light and Jesus Christ who is the word says I am the light of the world is because it is light and there's no darkness in light. <laughs> it's just the opposite of that. And so it's a wonderful thing. And yet it must be understood. We've already gone through the second chapter of 1 Corinthians where it, it talks about the fact that to the natural man, the things of God, these writings are just nonsense. They don't understand them. It's just a bunch of words and confusion. But not so to the spiritual minded person who wants to delve into God's word. But that doesn't mean that we don't struggle because we must study to show ourselves approved as Paul tells us or tells Timothy and we read it. Look with me to start with at 2 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Peter, 2 Peter. Peter says something very interesting here and almost funny. 2 Peter chapter 3, here he's talking about end time things. And he says in verse 14, 2 Peter 3, 14, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Live your life according to the knowledge that Christ is coming again. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. The fact that he hasn't come, uh, he, there's purpose in that. And he's giving us more time, as it were, 
uh, to, to, to herald the truth and bring his elect to himself and also to mature us. And he says, just as also our bro beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, and also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures, to their own destruction. Now, the only reason I'm bringing you here is to understand, and that's why, you know, I have, I don't know how many commentaries at home. I got books all over the place. And there's hardly two of them that agree on anything. <laughs> In general, they do about the base thing, basic things. But there's a lot of discussion about this and a lot of discussion about that. And, and, and the Bible is hard to interpret. It's difficult. There's a lot of distortion. And we have to lean upon God and His mercies to point us in the way that we should go. But I'm going to say to you, it always makes sense. When the light comes on and we see what's there, you say, whew. And you've experienced that, haven't you, as you study God's Word? Things that, that you says, you know, what in the world is he talking about here? What is he talking about there? And then the lights come on and you see that and it clarifies itself to you. And he says, oh, how wonderful. Why didn't I see that before? But there's also a lot of distortion. And the passage before us in 1 Corinthians 13 is a classic object of distortion. And people wanting to make it say something it does not, and basically, and there's a tendency with all of us to do that, and we have to be very careful to make something say what we want it to say in order to support our agenda. And we must always go to the Word of God with not my agenda, but God's agenda. It's not what I think that matters, it's what He thinks, right? We are learners of Him. He's not learners of us, and He's not changing His ways on account of our foolishness. So it's always a business of learning and understanding what God has to say instead of what people want it to say. Now, in particular, we're looking here at this whole business of speaking in tongues, which is uh, run into and, and gotten into the churches, many churches and many people are in the pro and practicing that or engaged in that and thinking it's biblical and, and much of their support is going to lie right in the very pages that we're going to address today. And so in that sense, it's very important. Now, the section I've titled here, beginning in verse 13 to 17, is speaking credibly. Up to now... Paul has been speaking in general about tongues, priority, with an emphasis on those hearing. Now, he focuses directly on the person speaking or the source of speaking in tongues. And that's why he says, beginning in verse 13, Therefore, let the one who speaks in a tongue Pray that he may interpret. Let the one speaking in tongues. This admonition is confrontational for instruction. Those speaking, in other words, have an obligation. What is their obligation? That he may interpret. Now let me just say that anytime somebody speaks on behalf of the things of God, including yours truly up here, and, uh, and, and in that sense, I don't take that lightly. I do so with fear and trembling. Is that I have an obligation not to represent me and not to show me off, but to represent Jesus Christ, my King and my Lord. And that's why James in James chapter 3 and verse 1 would say, Let not many be teachers, for they incur the stricter judgment. I have a stricter judgment. 
If I'm misleading you, if I'm causing you to stumble by my own stumbling, brother, I'm in trouble. So we never take lightly the things of God. And these that are speaking in supposedly at least, this foreign language, this tongues in the church assembly have a responsibility as well. The therefore that we said connects back to edification of the church which is seen at the last part of verse 12. Seek to abound for the edification of the church. So right there is their responsibility. And that edification can't be skewed off on some other pathway that it's really not edification. That edification has to be by definition the edification that God says, which is building up in the most holy faith. We've looked at that in Ephesians chapter 4, for example, where Paul tells us why he gave the gifts to the church that he gave, so that we might come to the likeness of Christ, to a mature man, all built around the love of God, love for Him, and love for one another. So he says, and here's the obligation here. Therefore let one who speaks in the tongue pray that he may interpret. Interpret means something. We normally think of that means to understand what the scripture says, right? Let's uh, look back at Luke 24. On the road to Emmaus, the Lord Jesus did something when He appeared after His resurrection to these disciples that were walking down that road and they were dejected and, and troubled because they thought it was the end because Christ had been crucified and died and they were without hope and so forth. And you know that the Lord appeared to them uh, on that road and He did something very special. He unveiled to them the truth. Look at verse 27, Luke 24, 27. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. That word interpret there is the same word used here by the translators. He explained to them. He interpreted to them. So when we're going back over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and we're looking at this, pray that He may explain to them. So whatever this speaking is in this supposed foreign language, it needs to be also explained because it's for, as he's already said, the last part of verse 12, edification of the church, the building up. And the word pray here, and the idea, is to ask God to give a means of making their contribution beneficial to the church through clarity in what is stated. Now MacArthur says there's a hint of righteous sarcasm here. I think there is because these individuals don't seem to be in the least cared about what anybody else is thinking or doing or whether they're being built up in the faith or not. They're all about showing off. Look at me. I can speak in tongues. Aren't I great? God has me particularly blessed, doesn't He? Look at me. I have this extraordinary gift. And here's Paul saying, no, you need to pray. But God can use this to build up, to edify others. And there's a little bit of righteous sarcasm in that. And it's Paul's way of forcing credibility, bringing honesty to a person speaking gibberish with no accountability of what is supposedly in a foreign language. So that they're not just showing off, but there's something they're contributing, something that is beneficial something that is a blessing to others. And that's what the Word of God accurately and righteously delineated 
is always. And so he's basically saying, before he starts publicly speaking babble, ask God to help him clarify what is being said with the responsibility of explaining what is being said. In verse 14 he says, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Now he gets even more personal because now the connectivity is not just from the person speaking to the congregation or to the assembly, but now he's taking it to who? He's taking it to God. And he's making an analogy. If I pray in a tongue, which is a foreign language, using the verse 13 scenario, he is addressing God and doesn't know what he's saying. That's what he means by my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Now here's a real disconnect. There is a disconnect in the person that is doing this, Paul is saying, between his spirit and his mind. Do you see that? Unfruitful is the Greek word akapos, means barren, not producing anything. Nothing is being said, in other words. His mind is not engaged with the prayer. So here's an individual using this analogy now of not just talking to the assembly of people, but talking to God. If I disengage my mind and I'm just making noises unto God, am I really having communion with God? So before we've seen the same analogy with the hearers, now within the person supposedly speaking in tongues as foreign language, there's a, 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 a division between noise and understanding, babble and actual communication, and who is it with? With God Himself. Now please, let's just go back and, and understand the very lang uh, idea of language has the fixed purpose of actual communication. Real language is never merely emotional contrived noise. If, if you try that sometime, try it with your children or whatever, and just start grunting and making noises at them and honk a horn and bloop bloop and obbity doop doop. Now it's pretty cute when it, you know when our my grandchildren are as cute as they can be when they're goo gooing and ga ga and all this, but it's not so cute I don't think when they become adults and they're doing that. They say, "Start, there's something wrong with you." Right? So Paul is bringing into question whether this is actually, I believe, a true gift being exercised or someone emotionally showing off, babbling gibberish. And may I say the same thing is happening today and drummed up babbling in churches claiming to practice such and even promoting it and trying to hold courses and classes on it and everything under the sun to contrive it up. This little phrase, my spirit, please notice in verse 14 in the middle, my spirit prays. Rightfully lowercase because what is it? My spirit, not the spirit of God, right? Please understand that. It's my spirit. So he's not referring to the Spirit of God, which is the right source of the actual gift, is my point. He's using an analogy of my spirit here, which I believe is probably that intangible bit of us. The Spirit is something of a mystery in Scripture. But it's that intangible you and me that has the sort of the housing of who we really are and our will. It houses our emotions, and the, and the word you know is pneuma, which is air or breath, because it's something we can't see. Would you go with me back to Acts chapter 2, which was the origin of this whole business of speaking in tongues, and of course it marked the coming of the Holy Spirit that Christ had promised His disciples. And in Acts chapter 2, we go to where the, the gift began, and we notice it's 
Acts chapter 2, verse 4, it's not those that are speaking in these foreign languages speaking in their spirit, but what spirit? Verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Verse 6, and when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each of them was hearing them speak. Notice, babel and confusion. No. In his own language. And so from that they became, it says, amazed and astonished and so forth. And then he even gives a description down in verses 9 to 11 where all these Jews that had been dispersed and, and were living in all of these different countries... Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, and, and so forth and so on. They were speaking different languages there. They had learned different languages. Now they're meeting together expecting these Galileans to not be able to speak their language, but they're just speaking it fluently because it was a gift from God. And notice also what they were speaking. Look at verse 11, Acts 2, 11. He says, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. Now, who are these they? It starts out in verse 2, ch uh, chapter 2, verse 1. They were all gathered in one place. That is the disciples. That's who he's talking about. Now, they gathered this huge crowd around them because of this commotion, but originally it was just them. They were doing exactly what Christ told them to do, to pray and wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit, and here it comes. And so here are those that had witnessed the mighty deeds of Christ. Right? And what are they doing? They're preaching of the mighty deeds of Christ. Not a bunch of hooey-patooey and noise at all. Now back to our passage in verse 14. He says, If I pray in a tongue, a foreign language... He says, then I am, but my mind is unfruitful. There is a disconnect between my mind and my personal spirit of emotions. And I'm not preaching the mighty deeds of God. I, I can't, I, if I'm not, if I don't have them in my mind, if they're not pictured, if they're not connected with that, how on earth? Is that being accomplished? It can't be. And so this is different than what was taking place in Acts chapter 2. Real communication is not what is happening here. Or at the least, it is being brought into question. Some appear, in this context, to have been artificially trying to appear as though they had the gift of tongues, and no wonder... For well, that, I believe, is precisely what we have today in churches where emphasis is placed on this doing this. Now, you know, if you preach to people that unless you make noises in tongues, well, you're not one of God's own. What are you going to do? I'm going to go home and start trying to make noises. And my emotions, my spirit is stirred. But is that really real? Verse 15. What is the outcome then? Now this is also a little confusing because at least in my Bible, in the New American Standard, the outcome is noted in parenthesis, uh, excuse me, italics, to, to note that the translators added that. It's not in the original Greek. It's literally saying what is then, question mark, and then is the little Greek word un, and it literally means certain. Are you with me? 
Paul is saying, what is certain? So that Paul is saying here, the reality of what is going on is strongly questioned. How can God be mindlessly worshipped or proclaimed? How can God be prayed to mindlessly when my mind is disconnected and completely barren? So this is Paul's logical response to their Ill illogic. If I am doing something either serving, worshipping, or communicating with God, what's expected to be involved? All of me, isn't it? We don't just haphazardly, at least I hope and pray not, throw out things of God. These are sacred things. We don't just uh, treat God like He's some old dish rag or something. Everything about us, our reasoning, our mind, and actually with a true child of God, our faith is, is relying and leaning upon Him. Lord, help me even to be able to adore you, worship you, live for you because I'm not worthy, I'm not able of myself to do that. And all of us are engaged in that. So he's saying here, I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. There, he's attaching the two back together. I'm attaching who I am, my spirit, personal spirit, not the Holy Spirit, with my breath, emotions, my will, uh, the, the real me and all of that, with my mind, which has to do with discernment and uh, ultimately actual language because if I, if I, don't, I can't put, if, if I'm trying to operate without my mind, How can that possibly be? Now I ask myself in thinking in Scripture, where else can I find some sort of what I would call mindless communication with God? And I thought of one place. You may know where I'm going. Look with me at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 and Romans chapter 8 is about the Spirit of God working. What the law couldn't do, God did. And he points out the fact that if we don't have the Spirit of God within us, we are not one of His and so forth and so on. And then when we get down to verse 26, He's, and he's talking here about hope and what we, through perseverance, eagerly wait for, which is the consummation of all things, the glorification of the child of God that God has promised. And he says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. It almost sounds like <laughs> you're speaking out of your mind because of the Holy Spirit within you. But I don't think that's what it's referring to here at all. The larger context, again, is the Holy Spirit and the suffering that an individual goes through, that they have to persevere through in this life. And he's saying the Holy Spirit, not our spirit, first of all, it's the Holy Spirit, helps our weakness. We can't handle it by ourselves, in other words. And we don't even know how to pray as we ought. Now, why is it we don't know how to pray? In this context is Romans 8, 28. That's right up, right up next, almost next. And that is that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. So whatever I'm enduring at the moment, whatever trouble I have, whatever problem exists, I don't understand it. I can't understand it. And and often things are going on around me that I don't understand why God is doing this in my life or doing that, and you're in the same position. What do we do? We fall back on the Holy Spirit. We don't even know how to pray. I don't know whether to pray, Lord, take me out of this, or Lord, give me more of this, or Lord, I don't know what I'm doing because I just have to fall back in faith. 
trusting my Heavenly Father that whatever's going on is my, in my best interest. And that's what he's saying here. And so we just, under the burden of the trouble, we groan. But God, the Holy Spirit, is there to help us and to even intercede for us. That's all he's saying. It's not talking about speaking in tongues at all. So it has nothing to do with this noise in worship that is a show-offy kind of noise. It's addressing suffering and troubles that overwhelm us. And so Paul doesn't even stop there. He also brings in singing. Now we heard that this morning, how precious that was. And I think he uses that for a good reason. He's also talked about prayer here. You've got to pray with the mind and your spirit. And I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the mind also. Now, our two brothers that got up here and sung this morning, I, boy, they did a wonderful job. And if they had just got up here and just started honking all kinds of odd noises, I don't think we'd had the same response. Do you? They sung with their spirit, but they also sang with their minds. You know, I, I even thought to myself, isn't this the whole argument of evolution? It's all about God being God and having a purposeful and intentional, uh, glorious design for things. Do you think you could be created by time plus chance? If you think that, Lord help you. That's what I call being in darkness. That's what's foolish. That's the same thing here, isn't it? He uses singing because it is impossible to honor God without reason and intelligent design regarding our communication. That's the point. It's like anything else that we do. And certainly with God, it ought to be the highest level of that, not the lowest level. In verses 16 and 17, my, I need to move along. Let's see here. He says, Otherwise, if you bless in the Spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the Amen at your giving of thanks unless he does not know what you are saying? Bless is eulogio in the Greek. It means to praise. You think of the eulogy at a funeral. You're speaking well of the person. And ungifted is literally the word idiotis, which you get the word idiot, right? And it has to do with unlearned, ignorant. In Acts 4.13, it's used as untrained, those not knowing the language. In other words, they're, they're not familiar with whatever is being said. They can't judge it accurately. They can't judge it correctly if they don't know it. And the word amen that we use here in many churches and down through the years, the, the saints have used, is a Hebrew word for agreement and encouragement. And so he's saying, if you don't know what is being said, how can you even know whether you should agree with it or not? If I come in here and I'm just babbling to you for a period of time, you can't measure it by the Word of God. Of course, they didn't have the Word of God except the Old Testament. But you don't know what's being said. I could have been telling you all to go to thunder or something. You wouldn't know that, right? Or I could be just making noises, whatever. See, Paul is doing nothing here but making sense. In verse 17, the argument continues. He says, for you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. Now he makes, I think, the, gives the person the speaking in this foreign language the benefit of the doubt here. That is, I think your intentions are good. Supposedly you're giving thanks to God, but it defeats the, the supposed purpose. Why? Back to verse 12b. The other people are not edified. The very purpose is defeated. The opposite occurs. And he's saying that outsiders looking in, somebody comes into your midst, and here's somebody just standing up over here and babbling and making noises and so forth. What are they going to think? Well, these people are 
nuttier than a fruitcake. And you know, Christians have enough trouble with the world system because of so much hypocrisy and confusion anyway. They don't need to add this to their troubles. And this is an altogether different than Acts 2, where God was glorified, people heard with their own language, and came to faith in Christ, and 3,000 were truly converted. But Paul is saying, here's people involved in questionable activities leading to a ridiculous testimony. Verse 18, he says, and here we have serene control. That means clear purposeful and measured activity. And first he says, it's a selfless attitude. Doesn't sound like it when he says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. It sounds like he's bragging there. No, he's doing just the opposite. He is stating he has the gift of tongues, speaking in foreign languages, and speaks in them more than you all. And so he's first of all making it clear he's not on an anti-tongue campaign. He's not against God using this God-given temporary gift. He uses it. He is setting the attitude of selflessness. Using this gift was never about Paul showing off. It's to be used for its purpose, for Christ's sake. So what's the context here? Where is Paul talking about he speaks in tongues? We have to ask ourselves, who is Paul? He's a great missionary, isn't he? He founded most of the churches. He founded this church in Acts 18. He visited most of the foreign lands that were mentioned in Acts chapter 2. And he's saying, God gave me the ability supernaturally to communicate with them as a gift of God. Now, how do we even know that? Because the context here is, look at verse 19, However, in the church, I desire to speak five words, so forth. He's showing a contrast between where he uses his gift, which is in the missionary field, where people need to hear the truth in their own language, and in the church assembly, where there's a bunch of showing off going on. So Paul was not using his gift in the assembly, but by contrast, where appropriate to evangelize. Now, that's the selflessness of it. We, if I have a gift and you have a gift, we are to use our gift to please God, not to please ourselves. We're to use our gifts for God's glory, not for our glory. We're to use our gifts to edify others, not to edify ourselves. Amen? Amen. So rather than bragging, Paul is saying this gift should be used appropriately under serene control, clear and purposeful, to use it to edify others when appropriate. And then in verse 19, he says, However in the church I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now let me just say once again, this verse validates that when we're talking about tongues, we're not talking about Babel, because what does he say? Words. Not goo-goo and gaga, but actual words who would be found in our English Webster's Dictionary, right? That's very clear. But what is he saying here? However, shows the contrast, and the contrast is made. Literally, myriads of words... What good would it be, as I said last time, if we had a man from China that didn't speak English come here and preach to us? It could be the most wonderful sermon that had ever been made, but if you didn't know what he was saying, and I didn't know what he was saying, and nobody knew what he was saying, what good would it do? Nothing. It wouldn't edify anybody. And that's what Paul is making this very common sense Remark, five words spoken from God with the mind, logical, so that I may instruct others, he said, so that it brings benefit, it brings truth, it points to Christ. Words spoken with preciseness. Now, may I just remind you, that what is it that God uses to save an individual? 
babel and confusion? No. He uses truth. He uses light. He uses logic. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Paul says in Romans 10, 17. We go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22 and 23. You are born again, not with seed which is perishable, but imperishable, the, the living and abiding word of God. James in 1.18 says, In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. Oh, how precious is truth. How precious. It's, it's, the, it's the living word of God, Hebrews 4.12. It's able to divide asunder between the soul and the spirit and is able to, to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It can do something that nothing else can. It's living. It's active. It has the very power and authority of God. It's special. There's nothing like it anywhere. Let's not be messing with it. If you get right down to it, that's the point of all of this. And so in closing, we need to be fully aware of what's going on in the name of religion and be able to give answers as to what we believe and why. Christianity is not silly, not unreasonable. It's the only reasonable answer to man's dilemma and sin. There is no other answer. And the Word of God sets men free. Now, I'm not aware that we have a problem here in this church of people trying to speak in tongues. And I thank God for that, that you're not confused about that or don't appear to be. How's there, however, there's a lesson for us here. And the difference is between emotions and reality. Good intentions and actuality. You know, when we just talk simply about the broad road and the narrow road, that leads to life and few there be that find it, you have all kinds of people that have all kinds of good intentions and even in, involved in all sorts of religious activities, but they're lost. And on the, they're on the road, the broad road, that leads to destruction. God help us. Our mind needs to be the mind of Christ that's right here. Not fairy tale land. Not sidetracks. Not confusion, but good old truth. There's always an infinite gulf between pretension and substance. In closing, I want you to turn over to the, we're almost there, to 1 Corinthians 16 again. Because the things that are said here that are wrapped up by Paul have everything to do with everything else and all of these rebukes and corrections that Paul has made. Notice verse 14, 16, 14. Let all that you do be done in love. It's not about you at all. It's not about your showing off. It's not about you being religious. It's not about me. It's about having the love of Christ, being like Him. And so everything you do, everything that's done in this church, oh God, help us to do it in love. Love for you first. We love because he first loved us. And the love of God has been poured out in our hearts, says Paul in Romans 6. And with that poured out in our hearts, we should love one another so that we have the best interest and the best thing that we can possibly do for anyone is to point them, as I say again, to Jesus Christ, the only hope. And build them up in the most holy faith. Down in verse 22, he says, Whew, powerful. If anyone does not love the Lord, he's to be accursed. My friend, it's not our religion, it's not our anything. Anything we can do in the name of religion. And certainly that gets within the whole issue and the silliness of tongues or whatever it is that we think that we can do to be impressive. I don't care what it is. We can make it artificial. We can, we can drum it up of our own will and, and whatever. 
but he's ultimately saying if you don't have love for God, if you can't love the Savior because he died for you, and you want to live for him, now you're not going to do it perfectly. I'm not talking about perfection here. There's something wrong. If you can look at, we're going to look at the table here in a minute. If you can look at the table and what he did on that cross, when you are hopeless and helpless and without any possibility, he died that you might have eternal life. If you don't love him, there's something wrong. That's what Paul is saying. And that goes back to this whole business of the business of what we're looking at when we're looking at these things that had sidetracked individuals that were there misinterpreting what is being said and being done. And I think in the context here, they're misinterpreting it. <laughs> Even the rebuke they're misinterpreting. I mean, it's, un it's amazing. You take a direct rebuke for what you're doing, and the modern tongues movement has flipped it upside down and says, See, they're speaking in tongues. Isn't this great? We need to do that too. God help us. And I'm not trying to pick on anybody or make fun. I, I want people to know Jesus Christ, and I know you do too. And I trust today that you know him. There's nothing more important than that. And that you know him in truth. And that you love him. Would you bow with me, please? Father, we thank you for your truth. And forgive us where we get sidetracked. And show us the errors of our ways. That we might embrace you wholly. And that when you come, you might find faith on the earth. And help us to be a blessing to others. Help us to even know how to, to communicate and talk in a way that is beneficial and pleases you. And that others can understand and also see within it the love of Christ. May we communicate that way with one another. All for the glory of Jesus Christ we pray.